But when you go to the places where the events took place and you know what took place there, it opens energetic and spiritual doorways that can be absolutely overwhelmingly powerful. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Eth, and today we are excited to welcome back to the podcast Master Spirit Scryer and Druid, Ben McStefan. Ben McStefan is the founder of the Dune Moore Druid Order, based in Colorado Springs, having studied Druidry for over 20 years. Ben also shares wonderful stories of Irish legends and Druidry on the Order's YouTube channel, and many listeners know Ben as the scrying partner for ceremonial magician Frater Ashen Chassan, where they both have journeyed deep into the spirit realm for years, reflected in the book Gateways Through Light and Shadow. Ben is a native of Colorado Springs and has Scottish and Irish ancestry, and he was given his interest in Celtic heritage by his grandmother, Suzanne. Ben is a lifelong student of the Irish language, both its modern and older forms, and he's currently translating folk stories from Irish to English. In order to help move us forward as a species, Ben says that we must acknowledge and heal our internalized abandonment pain, which can help us realize our collective Don. And Don is an old Irish term that refers to the poetry of life that moves us towards our destiny. And annihilating the illusion of separation between ourselves and the other is what Druidry is all about. And among his many other sojournings through this Malkuthian plain, Ben started as a professional archaeologist, helping catalog and survey Aboriginal American sites on the Fort Carson military base. And after working in archaeology, Ben helped found a web development and software company and worked in that field for 10 years. And then Ben went on to work for Pikes Peak Hospice and Palliative Care in patient care and administrative positions. Ben shares in this chat about the foundational aspects of Druidry, key tips for scrying, the biggest misconceptions people might have about scrying, the importance of having a commitment to truth, why thinking in poetics and writing poetry is so important, the connections between Solomonic spirits and Druidic deities. Ben also answers your Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions, which were so wonderful. Thank you all so much. And he discusses so, so much more. And I also want to thank the esoterically wonderful Helena for her questions and her suggestion to have Ben on the podcast. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome Ben. And Mick Stefan. Ben Mick Stefan, thank you so, so much just for taking the time and coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. You're always so well researched and so very thorough. It's one of the best things about your show. And I'm very, very happy to be talking with you again. You mentioned, Ben, about your grandmother, Suzanne, and how that was kind of one of the first times that you started having an interest in your Celtic heritage. Can you can you share a little bit about your grandmother and your early experiences with Celtic heritage and with the spirit world? Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about my grandma. Really, my first memory of her when I was born, actually, my this was, you know, early 70s. I'm giving away my age here, but my mother had a flu. So my grandmother was the one who took care of me. Back in those days, they wouldn't let, you know, mothers hold you and all that stuff if they were sick. I think really the first motherly contact I got was my grandmother. And as I got older, it was really, you know, all she would have to do is put her hands on my face or anywhere my shoulder or my hand, anything like that. And I just felt instantly relaxed. And as I've gotten older, I've definitely realized that a lot of things are passed on between your ancestors and you just through touch. You know, you can learn so much from another human being just by what they're giving you 
through their hands or their eyes or their voice. And she used to talk about where the Scottish side of my camp family came from, the Frasers. We were a Brewster sept of the Fraser clan. Told me some stories about the things that she had heard when she was growing up and some of the spirits that she encountered when she was growing up. So I really feel like one of the reasons I've been able to occasionally have that gift and, and to be able to see, I really owe it to her. When you were with your grandmother, as you mentioned, there's the importance of touch. Was it a gradual process being with your grandmother and kind of experiencing this slow introduction to, I guess for lack of a better phrase, non-materiality or something beyond what you can see with your five senses? Or was there kind of a, a sudden experience that happened? Or what can you share about that? It was definitely sudden for me. And it happened... I think the first time that I ever saw something was when I was, I think I was maybe six or seven years old. And initially, the experiences that I had were rather terrifying or not very pleasant. I was asleep one night and I woke up. I was looking out. I was in a bunk bed and my sister was sleeping on the bunk bed below me. She was much younger than I was. And I somehow just knew that there was someone in the room I had my eyes closed, but I could see what looked like a dark form approaching the bed. And it reached its hand out and touched me on the foot. And the whole time, I think part of me was like, oh, I'm just sort of imagining this or I'm, you know, doing make believe. But as soon as I saw it reach out into its hand, I physically felt something touch my foot. It was scary. It was just not something that I'd ever experienced. And that particular spirit continues to visit me to this day. And I've never been able to figure out who they are. As I do all these things and I can answer all these questions, and that's the one thing I've just never been able to, uh, I've never been able to understand. I don't know who the spirit is. I don't know if it's an ancestor or it's just, it really escapes me. And then I told my mom about it and she, you know, was kind of that pat pat. Oh, it's just a dream. You know, you'll be okay. But when I told my grandmother about it, she was the very first one to say, oh, well, similar things happen to me at night. And I believe you. It was a good understanding to have with her. And it made me accept some things that I think otherwise, had I not accepted them, would have been a lot more difficult to integrate. How do you process emotion during something like that? Like, did you feel fear? Did you feel apprehension? Did you feel just a sense of strangeness? Like, how did you process that uh, both after it happened and then, and then after chatting with your grandmother about it? I remember after the initial experience, before I was able to talk to my grandmother about it, I could not sleep alone. It was, I just, from that night, for months until I was finally able to talk to my grandmother about it. And she was the first one to say, look, it's not going to harm you. I don't know what it is either, but it's never harmed me. And I think it's giving us something, but even she didn't really know what that was. I think it continues to uh, give me things or possibly take things away from me, psychic baggage or burdens or things that I'm not meant to carry any further. I mean, honestly, Alex, that's really speculation. I, it's just one of those things that's just always been very confusing. But I think when it comes to the emotions of it, I, for years, especially when I was little, it was, I was just afraid and was really hoping that it wouldn't happen anymore. The second thing that came along was, boy, I haven't thought about this in a while, actually. I had a recurring dream of being in a, I don't even know quite how to describe it, but it was like a a really vast gray plain with slightly rolling hills and a very dark gray sky. And there would be these massive boulders that were being thrown at me and crashing nearby in the cadence of my heartbeat. They would happen pretty frequently, but the hardest thing about it was, was that I would wake up And I remember walking around my room, still seeing what was going on. It was like I couldn't get out of the dream, even though I knew I was awake. I knew I was walking around the room. 
I could see the room, but I could also see what was happening in the dream. And it, it was really unpleasant. My mother had con- some concerns about my mental health and I did a little bit too, but I don't know. There was something about talking to my grandmother about a lot of these experiences that helped me to integrate and accept them. And when you don't, and when you integrate them and you accept them and you lose the fear about it, it normalizes it, I guess, to some extent and allows, allowed me to put my hands around it a little bit more, if that makes sense. Not only were you having these experiences, but these experiences were staying with you in a conscious state, this actual state of being beyond materiality in a way or in another another world and in, in this kind of other topography was was literally following you around like it was it was a part of you. Yeah. And as time has gone on, you know, it's really made it very clear that that I think can be very dangerous when you're bringing that stuff with you into your waking consciousness. There does have to be a line there. Otherwise, I still have to go to work in the morning. You know, I still, I have children to raise and I have my everyday life that I need to take care of. And if those two get blurred too much, you know, both sides of me suffer. And I really have to credit one of my first teachers beyond what my grandmother was able to teach me was Orion Foxwood. And he really helped me see seership in a totally different way. And it helped me to see that there was dawn in it, there was destiny in it, as you mentioned at the beginning, that there's an element of a gift to it, and there's also an element of responsibility and fate, I guess. But I do think to some extent that there's a lot of people who probably have that ability to see into the spirit world, but we've lost our initiatory traditions for the most part in the Western world. And I think that it's a good thing we're reclaiming that because I think that a lot of what we consider mental health problems, you know, these days is really has more to do with sight and ability. It's just that we don't have a context to put that into. When you were experiencing this before all the formal scrying, before getting into actual engagement with the spirits, how did you learn to set up boundaries? Just like you said, how did you learn to keep things at a safe distance, or as, as you said, you know, like getting up in the morning and going out to the job. I mean, how, how did you do that, especially when you're going through these, these sometimes very, very intense experiences? Yeah, actually, I didn't do it very well when I was a child and it really into my, up until junior high, because my grandmother, for her experiences, you know, she had no initiatory traditions whatsoever. I mean, she grew up on a farm in rural Canada. You know, it wasn't like it is today. You know, you didn't just have an occult bookstore. You could go down and know our networks on the internet that you could plug into. You know, she was just her on her own pretty much. The thing that actually, I sort of feel like it was sort of forced on me how to integrate that was um, when I was starting in junior high, I began to have epileptic seizures. They started out And it was really the first experience of of really understanding that the body and the spirit can be separate for a time. The terminology has changed quite a bit, but back when I was having seizures, I had what I knew then as petit mal seizures, which are basically, you're able to receive input from the outside world, but you can't interact back in any way. It's like someone takes the levers out of your spirit's hands for your body. So you can experience everything and see everything that your body is experiencing, but you can't interact back. There was some medications and like things like phenobarbital and all sorts of, you know, the madness of of modern pharmaceuticals that you go through with those things. And it was damaging my liver. Phenobarbital, especially, you know, you're just sort of a walking zombie. My teachers could really tell that it was affecting me in a bad way. And so could my mother, but they didn't really know what else to do. And then as I got into high school, they got worse to where I was having grand mal attacks where I you go through convulsions and I would lose memory for about five minutes before the seizure would happen. So when I would wake up, I would have all these people standing around me and have no memory of where I was or how I got there. You know, when you have that sort of thing happen and 
like at a pep rally. It happened once there and uh, all sorts of stuff. You know, as kind as people want to be, there's a certain, they do look at you a little differently after an experience like that. And it kind of made me feel a lot more isolated and pretty alone. And, uh, you know, I just sort of felt like a freak. I mean, you know, I know we most, almost all of us feel like freaks in high school, but that uh, made it difficult. And then when I went to college, that's when I really started to look into things like Druidry and other things. And I don't know what it was, but I decided to stop taking my medication and I started to do some chanting. I was able to keep them from occurring again through meditative practices and re relaxation and breathing techniques that just sort of came to me intuitively. It was kind of a forced process. And I feel now that I look back at the whole experience, I think that the reason the seizures got worse and worse is because I was ignoring that side of myself, that I was ignoring that gift that I did have. And when it is dawn like that, and when I say dawn, I mean that in the old Irish term, D-A with an accent, N, it's cutting off a part of who you are. And when, when you do that, you can't function as a full human being. You decided to stop with the medication and instead do chanting. What were some of the different things that you were engaged in or things that you were learning about or immersing yourself in at that time? Because that, that seems like a very, a very important time, a very profound time where you were really making a decision to kind of explore new things. It was. It really actually started, you know, keep in mind that, of course, when I first started doing this, I was pretty ignorant of a whole lot of differences between the various northern european traditions and you know initially i started with edred thorson's book on rune magic there were a lot of chants in there based on each of the runes and they you know he had a particular techniques based on what each rune meant if you were trying to change things about yourself or increase perceptions about uh you know, in certain areas of life there was one specifically that I used, and I can't even remember the name of it at this point, but it looks like sort of an, un an upside down U. It's got a very deep and low sort of U sound. And I used that whenever I was feeling that I was going to have an attack. Initially, what I began to really realize is I started doing more meditation and looking at things, looking at my mind more carefully with a lot more attention was that I would have a petit mal seizure where I could, you know, experience things but not interact a few, about 10 minutes before I would have a, a really big one. Basically, it forced me to stop anything that I was doing. If I was in the middle of class, I would just get up and leave. If I was at work, I would just, you know, say, I'm going outside for like 15 minutes. I'll be back shortly because if I didn't do it, I, I would have an attack. And I started doing this particular chant I would stare at the mountains. I'm lucky to live where I live. As long as my eyes were fixed on the mountains and I was doing this chant, that was what prevented it. Until finally, after about maybe three or four years of doing that, I stopped having seizures altogether. Thank goodness. That's absolutely incredible. So what were your interactions like in terms of spiritual entities were there other visitations at night for instance w were there a multitude of other spirits i know in the last podcast with brian you were sharing about a water spirit about a very powerful engagement one time there can you can you share mm. what what was that like as you were going through and kind of learning and developing when it came to you know i, I went to school at fort lewis college in durango and it's a kind of a rinky dink school, but it was a great place for me. And it's right in the base of the San Juan Mountains. You know, the earth energy there is just absolutely primordial and, and very, very powerful. And there's a specifically a place called La Plata Canyon down there that has a waterfall that is extremely powerful place. And the first time that I really felt like I engaged with the she or the fairy people was at that waterfall. It was the first time that I can recall being somewhere other than home and being outside where I saw a spirit in the natural world. And it, it's a little hard to describe, but it was inside of a, of a granite rock face and it was 
a spirit who I knew had noticed that I was seeing it and it was shocked that I was seeing it. And I don't remember any words being spoken between us or no, not really even much in communication, but there was sort of a surprise that I was clearly witnessing it. And I remember sort of coming out of a slight trance-like state when I was done and feeling a very deep connection to the place, which I still feel today. In fact, I ended up getting married there because it became such a powerful place for me. And I was able to see this spirit. It wasn't long after I had sort of figured out all of these things going on with my epileptic attacks and seizures. And I think it was in some ways the spirit's world sort of reaching out and giving me a token that I was headed in the right direction and that I was handling this as I was supposed to handle it. In Druidry, one of the big things that you talk about is Don, which is an old Irish term. It refers to the poetry of life that moves us towards our destiny. When you were having these experiences, and like that is just amazing when you're describing like the spirit itself in the rock yeah. is surprised that you can see it. When you were going through these incredibly just surreal and powerful experiences, were you learning about concepts like Don? Did you have a sense during these experiences of this is kind of my destiny, like I meant to do this? Or was it one off where it was kind of individual and you were kind of putting things together slowly? Or what was going on in terms of Don and in terms of feeling this kind of destiny? Yeah, I think that was really when I first started to think that there was an element of destiny to it. And at, at the time, I didn't know Irish lore or, or Druidic lore very well, you know, as I was just starting to get into it around that time. You know, these are terms that I put on these past experiences now only because I have linguistic context now that I, that I didn't have back then. I became obsessed. I mean, I really did become obsessed with Druidry. If you get me going, you know, even in my personal life, sometimes people are like, okay, enough already, <laughs> you know, because I really, really, it's the one thing I spend my time thinking about, considering and doing artwork about and all sorts of things. I mean, it really is the thing that I'm the most passionate about because it has helped me so much discover. It's been a great navigational aid through my life. Without it, I don't think that I would, well, I know I wouldn't be who I am now. It's always a little strange, you know, because I grew up in a, the Irish side of my family comes from more of a military background and a law enforcement background. And, you know, the Scottish side of my family comes from a more farming background. So there was a little bit more acceptance. It was a little easier to talk to on my father's side of the family than my mother's side. But, you know, as I've gotten older, my family has just sort of accepted that this is who, this is who I am. And these are the things that I'm interested in. And um, it's also helped them get some insight into some of their own experiences as well. But I think it did take me quite some time to come to grips with what was happening. And Don, to me, is, you'll see this with a lot of the older Irish terms. They'll have multiple meanings all in one word. And I believe that the Druids really picked some of these words to describe these things because they knew that these particular words held a lot of different meanings all at once and can apply in different ways depending on the context in which it's being applied, I guess. And Dawn is especially one of those terms where it's like it means skill, offering, poem, poetry, destiny, gift, talent. And so you know, you sometimes you have the gift to do things. Sometimes you have the talent to do things. Sometimes you have a destiny that it needs to be done. Sometimes it's meant to be an offering to others, not just a trophy or a prize. The way you interact with that energy, like a poem, whenever you see the word poet or poetry in old Irish stories, you have to remember the term Don, because when they say poem, they're usually saying Don, and there's all of that. All of those concepts are built into that one word, and it really opens up the tradition when you know the language. It, it's an absolute game changer. Your YouTube channel, Ben, which we will mm -hmm. definitely make sure to link to, is so amazing, not only because you could literally sit in a chair, pour yourself a drink, 
get by a campfire and just listen to you telling amazing stories about <laughs> Irish and Celtic myth and legend. That's that's one aspect of it. But to me, the other aspect of your channel is you really do explain and lay out the basics of Druidry. And you mentioned in one of your videos that there's this kind of, I will not say Trinity, but there are these three concepts, Don, Aeolas, and Imbas. And please forgive my pronunciation. What is the relationship and what are Don, Aeolas, and Imbas? And, and how does this relate to Druidry as a whole? So that's kind of the way that I have understood the tradition, the more I've, the more I've studied it and the way that those words interrelate. So, Olus is sort of like the lore. It's the body of, of things, you know. Let's say you, you know, in an archaeological dig, you find an artifact, like you find a cauldron or you find a, a spear point or something like that. That is a material object, but it has no life on its own without some interaction with you. And so, it's the same thing with the stories. The stories only really speak to you when you try to walk through the story on your own, when you try to put yourself inside of the story and imagine what it would be like to be there and what the emotions would be and that you're experiencing and others are experiencing. So, Olus is the skeleton that you sort of dig up out of the ground as the bones of the past. It's the lore. And if you, when you really look at the original translations of a lot of the stories, they're very cut and dry. They're, they're not extremely entertaining, but I think that there is a purpose of that because I, I think that storytellers were meant to have the integrity of the sequence of events and the characters and the names and the places. But each storyteller was expected to put their own spirit into it and embellish it and bring it to life in a way that was uniquely theirs. That's what an oral tradition does. And Druidry was an oral tradition rather than a written tradition. And so you start with Olus and then you have Imbus, which is inspiration. You know, it's that thing that is uniquely you, that you are born with and the vision and the perceptions and your own creative spirit that you and you alone possess. No one else can and no one else does. When you combine that, the way I kind of lay it out on my in this particular teaching is that Olus is like the cauldron. Imbus is like the fire beneath the cauldron. And what the cauldron creates or the steam that comes off the cauldron is dawn. So Imbus is what you give to the tradition, what you lend to the tradition that will remain after you have passed. And originally, when I first started into Druidry, I was really into kind of the hardcore reconstructionist type uh, pursuit of it. But as time has gone on, I've really realized, look, I don't want to copy and mime my ancestors. I want to bring something new to the other world when I die. I want to create a new feast for them when I arrive, you know, to the other world, when I make my final fairing. And Don is what the result of that interaction is between you and the tradition that you follow. It creates something new and allows the creative force of the universe to keep giving birth to new forms and new ideas. Can you share with the listeners who might not be too familiar with Druidry, what are some of the main rituals, commemorations, feasts, traditions that, that you practice and members of the Dunmore Druid Order practice? The Celtic year really focuses around the four cross-quarter dates. So, the times that are equidistant between the equinoxes and the solstices. So, the year starts at Samhain, which is, you know, Halloween, November 1st, which is the halfway point between the winter solstice and the, the autumn equinox. Imalik is the halfway point between the winter solstice and the spring equinox, so it's right around the beginning of February. And then Bialtana is the halfway point between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. And then the last one is Lunasa, and that's halfway between the summer solstice and the, the autumn equinox. Those are the most important dates at least as far as we know from 
the stories, the legends, and then, you know, just the folk folklore and the history of those times. And there were celebrations on the equinoxes and the solstices as well. But for whatever reason, the Druids really focused on the cross quarter dates more. I think it's because they're interested in the dream before the form takes place. So Salen is the dreaming for what the winter solstice will be. Imalik is the dreaming for what the spring equinox will be, and so on through the other cross-quarter dates. So they're looking at the place in which the new season is going to be born. It's the halfway point between those two points in time, and I hope that makes sense. So each of these cross-quarter dates, have, or the fesh as they're commonly called, which just means festival or feast, is where the most gatherings were held, laws were related, the judgments were given, contests were performed, offerings and sacrifices were done, feasting took place, gift giving took place, those sorts of things. And so today, a lot of Druid traditions, you know, will handle the, the fesh differently. It seems like most Druid orders will pay a lot more attention to the equinoxes and the solstices as well. And I tend to, my personal practice on those days is usually to have some either alone time or have just relaxed community time. So I guess those would sort of frame the ceremonial year. There's also the concept of lunar cycle. I've been working with a calendar stone from the Neolithic Mound of Noth for a few years now and have learned some things from using that. And, but I would say a lot of it is really having as much contact with the natural world as possible, making space in your practice for your ancestors as well. Definitely listeners, make sure to check out Ben's YouTube channel as well. It's so lucid and just, you know, relaxed and you can almost get lost in it a little bit, like kind of like just spend an evening listening to you share about these amazing legends and, and kind of laying out Druidry. It's just such a oh, gift. Great. Um, yeah, that's what that was my hope for it was, you know, because I really feel like reclaiming the stories is really important. If we start telling those again and we start becoming more comfortable with the stories and telling them, you know, just from the heart, that's a big step into opening doorways between us and our ancestors and opening up that energetic door that transcends time and space to where we allow those events to continue to echo in the present. Also on your channel, you have people from Ireland who, for example, are like, oh my gosh, I'm from Ireland and I've never heard the story kind of told this specific way. And it's so great because it, it reminds me of, you know, when I was hearing the stories when I was growing up in Ireland. So how did you decide to organize these amazing stories of Irish myth and legend that you tell? And where did you first start putting things together? And, and how did you first start putting things together? Getting comments from people in Ireland has been the best thing. That's the highest compliment I could have possibly received from that work. It was really, really cool to see those. And that's been tremendously inspirational. When it comes to the stories themselves, it can be a challenge because there are usually a number of different versions of the same story. And so, and some of them contradict. You might get one strain of story that was told in Cork versus another strain of story that was told in Connemara. And they're separated by time and place and all just local traditions. So they will they'll they were probably at one point one story, but they've diverged. Um, and that's the beauty of the of the oral tradition as it responds to the needs of people in the now. It's meant to change, it's meant to morph, to serve people in the present. So when I look at those tales, I basically, I'll, I'll take as many different versions as I can find. And I will basically try to come up with what I think the, in, from my own perspective, what the original story may have been. And so it takes some time to kind of dig through. I've got a number of different sources that I go to. And then I do a lot of, you know, thankfully, there's a lot of stuff online now. Ireland has the largest recording, both written and audio of folklore than any other country on the planet because of particular government and uh, academic endeavors. So there's a lot to draw from, thankfully. And uh, some of the sources are in Irish. 
Some of them are audio. And then various books that I've, you know, just managed to collect through the years. So initially I'll start with the different versions and you have to get rid of things you don't, that don't quite make sense. And you kind of go with what you think gives people the gist of the story or the, the spirit of what the story is trying to say. And then I learned so much going through it. I feel it revolutionizes the way I think about Druidry every time I do one. Does it change each time you tell it, if you tell it in different scenarios? And do you write everything down ahead of time? Or do you just kind of have the main points and, and just kind of weave it based on all of the sources? Or like, how do you do that so eloquently? It's just great. <laughs> oh, thanks. No, I definitely write a script. So I will compile the story. I usually do kind of an outline of how I think, you know, of what I'm kind of seeing as the major elements. I always try to keep my mind on the integrity of the tradition. So I don't change the sequence of events and I don't change the places and I never change the quotes. So I keep the quotes exact. I never mess with the quotes, like what a character says. I never change those, but I will change, you know, there are certain events that I might leave out because it might be of a, a part of the tradition that where the ending is so very different from the one that I prefer <laughs> There's some preferential, the versions that I tend to, you know, gravitate to personally. But yeah, I'll write it once I've got that outline done and I've got an idea of what the overall flow is, then I'll write a script. I'll, I'll usually edit it a couple of times and then, you know, I'll just start recording the voice. And then once I've got the voice part recorded, I'll start putting in the, some of the music and some of the sound effects and, you know, stuff like that. I don't want to go too overboard on the sound effects. I just put them in for a little bit of effect. I try to keep those as subtle as I can just to give people an idea of what's happening in the story itself and to make it not just the sound of my voice all the time. You've done a lot of work with Frater Ash and Chassan in terms of scrying and working in the grimoire tradition. But when it comes to Druidry, Ben, is there a similar hierarchy of spirits or how is the kind of i guess theology of the world laid out yeah i would say there's definitely a hierarchy there the celtic civilization when i say that i mean you know what eventually becomes the breton the welsh the scottish the irish the manx uh, cultures the manx people today they had a hierarchical society just like any other Indo-European tradition. So it's definitely embedded into the tradition and its, its particular cosmology. Although it's different from more of the Mediterranean cultures, it's not so much based on station or state titles or political titles. It's really more based on family affiliation. So clans and how clans related and how, how they fostered each other's children which clans were related to each other, which, which clans were not. So there's definitely a sense of hierarchy in it, but it has a, I guess, more of a tribal feel to it in the sense that there are familial relationships inside of the, the spirit world in that context that I've, that I've seen. And the most experience I've had with a fairy being in Colorado is I'm fortunate enough to live near a freshwater spring which runs not far from my backyard. I wasn't able to establish a real communication and contact with it until I'd been here, living here for about 10 years. They can be pretty reluctant, I think, to reach out to people until they've had a chance to observe you for quite some time. And I'm only just beginning to learn about maybe some of its familial ties. It's hard for me to tell whether that's simply because I'm looking at it from the tradition that I'm looking at it from. And so I'm contextualizing what it's telling me in that way, or if it does have familial relationships with other spirits in the land and, and some of the nearby mountains and how those relate to each other. So I wish I could be more clear on that. I hope that makes sense, but there's definitely a hierarchical relationship, especially, you know, I would say at the peak of that is are the two at Adonin, who are like the gods and goddesses, I guess, of, of Celtic tradition that do seem to transcend place. So some spirits seem really tied to place and natural features, whereas some are more broad reaching in their effects or their, or their dominion, if that makes sense. 
We do, Ben, have a listener question from Jeff Smith, who is asking, what differentiates Druidry from other belief systems, you know, for example, such such as Wicca. Can you kind of draw out for those who may not be too familiar, like just from your perspective? Yeah, you know, maybe preface this by saying, you know, right off that I have a lot of respect for Wicca. I don't see Druidry as as necessarily somehow inherently, you know, superior to Wicca in any way. But I definitely have my favoritism towards Druidry just in the sense that I feel that it has a connection with a deep cultural understanding of how the world works and how, especially if you come from, if you're genetically related to the Irish and the Scottish or or the Welsh or, or you're genetically related to a Celtic people, it's a path of least resistance. Now, that's not to say that someone who is black or latino or asian american can't you know have a celtic path in in, in no way am i saying that if you're drawn to it you're drawn to it and it's going to have power for you and is calling to you for a reason so i don't mean mean to make this a racial thing but i have noticed that the stories and the traditions have helped me understand my own family and its own past traumas in ways that I don't think that I could have understood without the context of Druidry itself. Whereas Wicca, at least my understanding of Wicca, and I'm no expert in that, it has its birth, you know, in Gerald Gardner, who seems like an incredible man and, and will probably go down as one of the great religious thinkers of the 20th century. But it has more of an English, you know, originally it has more of an, of an English understanding of how the world works And that's important because, you know, the English have their own particular history that is where they come from and who they are. But for Druidry, I think especially it gives context to and voice to a number of different perspectives on the world, some of which include Celtic Christianity specifically, and also how the spirit of the place that you're living in informs your tradition. And like in that way, it's like most indigenous traditions around the world. I've learned a ton about Druidry just from, you know, one of the great things about going to Fort Lewis College is that Native students get to go there tuition-free as part of an old treaty. So, I was exposed to a lot of Native students and Native traditions, and you really see the brilliance of Indigenous cosmology when you've been around it for a while. And Druidry has that inborn Indigenous brilliance to it. And when you go to some place like Ireland, you know, I've, I have focused most of my interest on Ireland. I want to go to Scotland as well, but I haven't you know, had the chance to do so yet. But when you go to the places where the events took place and you know what took place there, it opens energetic and spiritual doorways that can be absolutely overwhelmingly powerful, life-changing experiences. Specifically, there's a of the Baltre stones that are near Newgrange in the Boyne Valley. And it's where the story was where Cuchulain killed his son, Shadamtha. I just remember being in that spot on my own one morning as the sun was coming up over the sea. And uh, you really, there was a sadness in the place, just a real delicate, powerful sadness that I'll never forget. I'll never forget. And I think that the stories are like, it's like acupuncture, you know, how you you have meridian points on the land and you place a pin in a, a meridian point to activate that place. Knowing the story of a place is like putting a pin into that meridian point and allowing you access to that energy that you couldn't otherwise get. When you had that immense sense of sadness, was there also a heightened sense of engagement with spirits either native to that specific area or what was kind of happening as you would go throughout Ireland and reactivate, you know, learn the stories of of these places and kind of activate those meridian points? Yeah, probably the most powerful experience that I had was at a place that doesn't have a name. And often it's the really those kind of out of the way, small places that you kind of have to find by accident that tend to be the most powerful. 
I went to a place on the Barra Peninsula. I don't want to go t- into too much detail about where it is, but based on the uh, my interactions with a local man, he pointed me to this boulder burial that was halfway up uh, the side of a ridge, kind of in the mountains. And I walked up to this place by myself because my daughter was with me, but I dragged her to so many places. She was ready to just sit in the car and chill out, you know, but I headed up the mountain and came to this boulder burial. A boulder burial is like a Bronze Age burial of a king or a nobleman. And there's, there'll be a big boulder in the middle of it. And it'll be usually supported by three stones underneath that kind of makes a sort of a slight hollow space below it. And then the, the burial will be below that spot. And then there'll be a group of stones around the outside in a circle. And the amazing thing is, is on a lot of these boulder burials, you can still see the uh, cuts in the granite where warriors would sharpen their blades before they would go into battle. And, the, you know, you just you see these marks on the stone and you realize how old it is and how important this place would have been to this particular tribe. And my first interaction with, with a spirit was in Ireland was the spirit of this chieftain who was buried at this place. And I was surprised at how informal it was and how natural it was to speak to that kind of spirit. It was very different from, you know, some of the work that I've done with Frater Ashen. It's got that more Irish sort of down to earth. How are you? You know, in a basic conversation between two people with incredible insights thrown in. But there are also places there where it was past this boulder burial. And and the spirit told me, because the man had not mentioned this place to me, but the spirit said, okay, you've gone halfway. Now I want you to go a little bit further and you'll see this. And so I, you know, after my interaction with that left and there it was, it's kind of hard to describe, but it was a basically three very large slabs of granite that created a cave in the middle of them. I think that the line between the she and ancestors gets sort of blurred, but this was a place where I could definitely feel the she in that old, that really old sense. And it was a definitely a lesson to me that some of those places are a little too powerful <laughs> and a little too intimidating. And I was able to be there for a while. And I had one of the best, one of my most important and impactful visions at that place. But when it was time to leave, I was ready to leave. Um, I could only take the amperage of the place for only so long. I hope that doesn't sound too overly dramatic, but that, that some of those places there definitely have that effect. Ben, to that point, I'm wondering for someone with your vision, someone with your sight, with your gift, with your ability to naturally scribe, but then also in in other contexts, obviously, how do you cool down, so to speak, when you do have these intense engagements and you're like, okay, I am ready to leave. I'm ready to decompress. How do you pour cold water on the hot engine, so to speak, to kind of just cool it down? Can you do that? I mean, especially being so connected with your natural abilities to scry and to engage with spirits. One of my favorite things to do is I'll drink a ton of water. For me, it's about a bodily experience. I'll drink a lot of water and I will put my bare feet on the ground as much as possible after an experience like that. There's something extremely powerful and humbling and humanizing about having your bare feet on the earth again. I think we really forget. We just, I'm amazed at how very little human beings touch the ground with their skin. So if I get to a point where I've been through something that's a little too overwhelming or I'm having a hard time kind of coming back to a functional state of consciousness, Water and earth are are two of the most powerful ways for me to do that. I'm sure that there are other people who do other things, but the body is so very, very powerful and wise. You know, when you consider the body is, every cell in your body has the memory of what it is like to be in the belly of a star. Every cell in your body has 
been around since the, the creation of the universe and has the memory that goes that far back. And so we underestimate the wisdom and the ability of the body to stabilize the spirit. That's the way I will decompress from those things is I will get my blood flowing, my muscles moving, my, my lungs, you know, heaving, you know, I'll drink some water and I will touch the mother, so to speak. You know, actually too, Ben, this, this kind of gets to something you touched on before. And it's, it's another listener question we have from Jeff Smith, which is how was it when you did step into the circle, so to speak, with Frater Chassan, and here you are coming from this tradition of Druidry and kind of Celtic practice, <laughs> yeah. and then going into being a scryer with a ceremonial magician where, you know, there might be just like a totally different world there. Can you, to Jeff's question, like, how was that? It was very odd. It was very odd. He really had to talk me into it. I was pretty reluctant to start because I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's just such a different tradition and it's such a different way of relating to the other world that I'm just not, I have no familiarity with. And he was like, well, that's exactly why I want you to do it is because I feel like you'll be a lot more of an open door for these experiences. And you're going to relate it to me in a way that isn't overly educated in the tradition. And you'll just be able to see what you see and experience what you experience. The very first experience I had was we started out very simply because we knew it was going to be such a different system than what I was used to. He put me in an easy chair. He set up some wards and did some invocations. And I remember getting my first glimpse of an angel to what seemed to me be hovering about maybe 60, 70 feet above the home that he was in, as if I was looking through the ceiling and, and seeing it. I remember it telling us its name. It was successful, and we were both very happy about that. We started doing it more, and we just kind of took it slowly. One of the things I love about Fraterashan is that he's so incredibly patient with me. If he had enough experience and enough wisdom to know that it was just going to take time, you know, for me to be able to get acclimated to those new atmospheres. And because of that, it did really help me to kind of slowly make my way into a very different way of relating with the other world that ended up teaching me a lot about Druidry as well on a more energetic level and a more, I guess, maybe a symbolic level. You mentioned similarities on an energetic level. Were there other similarities with either individual spirits or perhaps just certain, certain impressions that you got after concluding a ceremonial session? Yeah, definitely. The one that stands out the most, and I'm probably going to butcher the name because I'm terrible at pronouncing the, <laughs> the angelic names, the angelic spirit of Venus. Oh, Anael? Yes, Anael. That's right. Yes, thank you. This whole experience is the book that I'm writing right now is based on this. When I had my first interactions with Anael, there was a tremendous feeling of familiarity and love. And at first I thought it was just because, well, it's Anael, you know, and this is kind of what she's about. But as time went on, I really began to understand that there was a very intimate connection between her and the goddess Breed, who is the one that I'm a devotee of in the Celtic tradition. During one of the sessions that, that I had with Radharash, and we were kind of exploring that, that insight, and I remember Anael showing me this mountain range that was covered in cloud, only the clouds were below the peaks. It was like a long mountain range, and there were like 10 or 12 different peaks that were rising up out of the mist. And she said, my relationship with Bridget is much like what you're seeing here. There's one mountain range below the clouds that me and Bridget are, yet we manifest in a different way above the clouds. Each peak is carrying its own song and its own insights based on the people and the realm of creation that it's trying to impact. So we express from the same mountain range. It was very impactful on me at that point. And that was what started my fascination with what the connections were between 
maybe some some of the more grimoric or angelic traditions and the Celtic fairy traditions. That there is definitely some sort of connection there between those spirits, no doubt. What a profoundly powerful experience. I, I can't even imagine you know witnessing something like that. And it, it really speaks to, Ben, I know something that Frater Chassan and Dr. Stephen Skinner and other guests have mentioned, which is the technology, quote unquote, of magic doesn't change. It's been the same for thousands of years, but peoples and cultures and religions may change. And the kind of presentation of a spiritual entity may change based on the operator and the magician and whoever is engaging. But the actual spirit itself might connect back to a very common source. Is that kind of somewhat fair? Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it because there just seems to be this connection between as we were going through the series of invocations that led up to his second book, you could feel that you were passing through energetic gateways as we went through it. And each time there was a familiarity with a particular spirit or vibratory rate or cosmic radio channel, you know, however you want to say it, that had similarities between some of the spirits that I had interacted with in Druidry. So I knew intuitively, just based on the feeling of when the spirit was in the room, that there was some connection between that experience of life or experience of the cosmos, even though they may have been expressing themselves differently based on whatever tradition, you know, it was coming from at the time. When you talk about these similarities, it's such a beautiful thing to to hear, especially from your perspective and someone with your vision and expertise. And to that point, we do have a listener question from Helena, who I know you know and who is awesome. Yes, and definitely. Yes, yes, she is great. And Helena is, is asking how do you approach astrology, Ben, and the influence of celestial bodies as a druid? Oh, well, that's the perfect question for her to ask. Um, you know, <laughs> that is kind of currently one of my big obsessions, actually, with, with druidry. And I have to credit a lot of that, actually, with an Irish author, Anthony Murphy. If you ever get a chance, he's just an absolutely fascinating individual. He's an Irishman who lives in the Boyne Valley, and he's been studying the megalithic structures in Ireland and their connection to celestial uh, movements and the connection that the stories have to celestial movements. And then there was another American researcher who, oh boy, his name is totally escaping right me right now, but he wrote, he wrote a book called The Stones of Time. It was him and, and I believe an Irishman who, there were just a couple of amateurs who ended up observing the calendrical sequence in which light shone into certain stone chambers in Ireland sequentially that followed the equinox and the, the solstices and the cross quarter dates. I could go on for days about that topic. It's, it's something that you could really, really spend, you can, you can literally spend a lifetime studying and nothing else. But my particular way so far has been through interacting with the three, what I call the three luminaries. Normally in astrology, they talk about the two luminaries, which is the sun and the moon. But I have a very strong sense that the number three is very important in Druidry. It shows up in all sorts of different symbolic ways in in the stories and all sorts of things. But Venus would be the th- that third luminary. And the megalithic structures are much like Newgrange, you know, so like on this last winter solstice, many of your listeners might know, and it's sort of famous throughout the world, that on the winter solstice is this one time of year where this beam of light will shine into the back recess of the chamber on the winter solstice sunrise. And it's obviously a deliberate construction. But what most people don't know is that there are only three celestial objects that will actually cast a shadow in that kind of darkness. The sun, the moon, and Venus will as well. It has enough brightness that it will actually cast a shadow, but it has to be extremely dark for you to be able to see it. 
So the first way I started working with celestial movements has been through this Noth calendar stone. And your listeners can probably look it up if you look up like Noth, which is spelled K-N-O-W-T-H. And you look up Noth calendar stone, it should come right up. And it's a Neolithic inscription that is basically a representation of the month and a 62-month cycle that comes out to be approximately five years long, which has to do with the Coligné calendar and how the Druids measured time. But the moon is the one that I've sort of started working with the most. And then now, but this book that I'm writing is about Venus and its connection with the mythological cycle of breed. One of the most common Neolithic elements you'll see in uh, Neolithic petroglyphs in Ireland are what were called cups and rings. Mm -hmm. Cups and rings is a usually a circle that will be surrounded by a series of concentric lines that will, will spread out from that circle. And then often you'll see a line that will bisect all of the concentric circles and, and go into the middle of the symbol. And... I really feel like part of what it's saying is that there's always, you know, correlative thresholds that will match the other cycles. So the last phase of a waning crescent carries a similar threshold energy to what Samhain carries. The dark of the moon carries a similar energetic threshold that the winter solstice carries. The very first crescent of the month carries a similar energetic threshold to Imolek and so on. And so you look at how these particular cycles in time connect to one another, and that's that bisecting line that is cutting through the various concentric circles, and the cup in the middle is kind of, you know, basically the present moment that it's affecting. So... I'm going to go more into this in my book, and I, I describe it a little bit in a lot more detail, but it's really just in the context of Venus and its particular way, its particular synodic cycle around the sun. Can you, Ben, just kind of share a little bit about the relationship between storytelling and intoning? Like when it comes to, in the Druidic tradition, vibrating to tell a story or vibrating something in ritual. What are some of the similarities about literally using your voice to tell a story or to enact a specific rite or, or ritual? Mm, yeah, no, that's a really good question. There's definitely a connection between the two. You know, when it comes to song or intoning, chanting of some kind, regardless of maybe what the tradition is, but especially from what I've seen in my work with Radharashan, is that there's a definitely a doorway aspect to it in the sense that the intoning is like the key and the lock that kind of opens that up and allows that connection to open in time and space. And so, you know, you're sort of creating a tunnel or a passageway of some kind for those energies to come through and for there to be an interactive experience where it's giving, we're giving, and there's a give and take happening there. And I think the same thing is the stories, because when you tell the stories, you're also opening up that same passageway that does transcend time and space. When you tell a story, say, about the Dada, who is a very important god in Irish tradition, and when you tell a story about the Dada, you're not only keeping the tradition alive and maintaining your, your pride in your own identity or your, or your own history or, or your ancestry, but you're also allowing the Dada to step forth into the present moment where you are and allowing him to observe and see and feel the place in which the story is being told. And that kind of interaction, when you tell stories, it's like the space between this world and the other world is being gradually pulled closer and closer together so that those pathways aren't so hard to walk. I guess it just feels to me that when it comes to stories, they're very similar to when you do chant or intone. There's an element of making that distance between you and another spirit 
and making it much, much smaller. If I'm understanding this correctly, Ben, what you're saying is if you were not to intone or if you were to just kind of take a completely different approach with a specific ritual or a specific entity or a specific spirit, that that might, you know, truncate something that might, you know, kind of short circuit a ritual or it might short circuit what would have been a potentially successful communication. Yeah, absolutely. And in Druidry, there are considered three cauldrons in the body. So you have your cortigoria, which is the um, cauldron of warming, which is said to be in your pelvic girdle. And then you have cora erma, which is the cauldron that's in your heart. And then cora soas, that's said to be in your head. And I think there's something when you can tell a story with your body, your heart, and your mind you're using gestures or dance or something like that as far as using your body to tell a story. You're putting your passion and your devotion and your sincerest interest. And you're also, you know, just speaking the sequence of events from your mind. When you engage those three parts of yourself fully, it opens that door so much wider and allows that interaction to take place so easily. Whereas if you're just reading something from a book as an invocation, or you're kind of taking a maybe more of a cookbook recipe approach, it's not going to have that oomph. It's not going to have that extra something or extra spice that it would when you're completely engaged in what you're doing emotionally, physically, and mentally. So when you bring those things to bear... If you have a passion for the tradition or you have a passion for the story, it's going to come out when you tell the story. People are going to intuitively know that, wow, this, this person really likes this tradition. This person thinks about this tradition. This person couldn't breathe without this tradition. And that's that extra element that you can't fake. Ben, you have so much experience, not only in Druidry, but also working with Frater Ash and Chassan. And we do have a lot of listener questions for you. But before we get to those, can you just kind of share a little bit about when was the first time you did formal scrying? And I'm putting that obviously in quotation marks because there's so many different versions of scrying. But I know many listeners are familiar with using you know, a black obsidian mirror or a crystal mm. or a flame or oil or water. Like, when was the first time that you actually did that, either in a druidic context or in a kind of a ceremonial magic context? Well, the first time that I used a surface to scry was I was actually on the Ute Reservation. <laughs> I was caretaking a campground for the Ute tribe with my wife. And it was a place where people would come and fish and, you know, that sort of thing. And it was right below an, an Anasazi ruin called Chimney Rock. It's kind of between Pagosa Springs and Durango. It was in the middle of the day. I was up on a hill and I was looking out over the water. And I was just looking at the pattern of the sunlight on the water. It started to form shapes and patterns and movements and I just kind of let my mind relax and I just sort of let these images sort of just come into my eyes. I saw this spirit emerge from water or from the light, I guess. It, have you ever seen those like 3D posters, you know, where you have to kind of like blur your vision and then it'll become suddenly three dimensional? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You kind of stare Magic at it a little stuff. bit. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was similar to that in the sense that the pattern started to form a three-dimensional space. And I saw this spirit emerge, dance, and in the middle of its dance, it just pointed over to this fisherman. And as soon as it pointed over to this fisherman, suddenly his line got hit with a fish. And he was like, whoa, you know, he's reeling this thing in. It was just obvious that the spirit of the place was giving him the fish. And that was the first time that I had ever used a surface to see. But that was sort of a spontaneous thing. And then the first time I did it formally was with Frater Chisan. It was with the Black Obsidian Mirror. The first time I just, it didn't work at all. I, could, I just was not getting anything from it whatsoever. You know, I was a little disappointed, and, and he was too, I think. 
but we worked with it a little bit longer and I started to get more impressions, more faint images, colors, really. They were kind of blurry and not very distinct and, and pretty unmeaningful for quite some time until I think it must have been maybe 10th or 12th session. And I was actually starting to kind of give up and thinking, well, maybe this, just, maybe this technique really isn't for me. I saw a face and it was very clear and very distinct. But I can't remember what was going on at the time, but we weren't really able to continue that particular style of scrying. And then it was with the crystal. That's when, you know, I really started to get, it was really more through the crystal that we used in the book. That was when I really started to see things a little, a lot more clearly using an object or a surface of some kind. Okay. So this Ben leads right into a listener question for you from Jeff Smith, who is asking, could you, Ben, please share your thoughts about the importance of the material and the shape of the tool being used for scrying? Jeff says there are so many arguments about it needing to be glass or obsidian or black spray paint, etc. What are your thoughts, Ben, about the shape and the kind of material that should be used? That's hard to say. I know that for me, like I said, you know, the obsidian mirror at the beginning, although we've actually used it recently, I've used it recently with him over the last uh, couple of months, although because of the pandemic, a lot of that stuff's been on hold. But initially I had that round crystal sphere was the one that gave me the most ease of seeing. It's hard for me to say. I wish I had more, a more of a broader experience of, of knowing other scryers. I, unfortunately, I don't. I don't know if it's just individual to me in that way, but I do think that one of the things that I've noticed working with Prado Chassan is that the tools that you create, the amount of devotion you put into making them and the amount of devotion and dedication you put into making them is really where the magic of those items really come from. So I don't know necessarily if it is so much maybe a question of the material or the shape as much as what's going to evoke your spirit as profoundly as you can. So if you get the willies or, you know, you get goosebumps when you're around at a black obsidian mirror versus a crystal sphere, then maybe the black obsidian mirror is probably the best one for you to use. But you may just have to have patience for it to work because it, it definitely took me a while to be able to use an item of some kind to be able to do it. But once I was able to do it, then uh, it does seem like they have, especially when they're dedicated to that one purpose, it brings the contact around a lot quicker and with a lot more clarity. Ben, this actually goes to a listener question from Helena again, who is asking, Ben, how do you determine when is the best time for scrying? Do you find, for example, that the veil is thinner and it's easier to contact spirits during specific seasons or lunar phases or dawn versus twilight? Can you share a little bit about the best time to scry? Yes, I know for me, and this is something that I, when you know she had asked earlier about how I related to the celestial movements when it came to scrying and other things like that, I have noticed as working with those things, I have a particular affinity to particular thresholds and a particular aversion to others. So, as I began working with it, I realized that, as an example, when the sun is crossing the meridian of the sky, which is your actual solar noon, which isn't going to be 12 o'clock, depending on where you live and, and the time of year. When the sun crosses the meridian, which is the highest point that it's going to get to in the sky before it starts to set, that's a threshold moment, you know, wherever you happen to be. But it's a threshold moment that I don't feel as comfortable in. If it's of an energy that for whatever reason, I don't feel incredibly comfortable inside of that energy. You know, I have friends who are total sun worshipers, whether they know it or not, you know, they're like, oh my God, it's, you know, sunny out. And I'm like, you know, maybe it's my, <laughs> it's my Irish ancestry, but sometimes it's like, ah, you know, I feel like a vampire, you know, in that kind of heat and that kind of light. And it sort of saps the energy for me. So I think it is individual. You have to observe how you feel at those thresholds. So how do you feel when the sun is coming up? How do you feel when the sun is crossing the meridian? How do you feel at sunset? Do you feel more connected to the other world at these particular times? Or do you feel more interested in just your common worldly affairs? Same thing with the phases of the moon, you know, like I've noticed for me, 
the area around the dark part of the moon, it's easier for me to see and it's easier for me to feel around that time. So whether it's beginning the first phases of the crescent moon, the dark moon itself, or the last few phases, the waning moon, something about that period of the lunar cycle opens doors for me. My particular opinion is, is that these things, it's a highly individual interaction with you. And it might have something to do with your ancestry, possibly, or your cultural understanding. Twilight is usually a very powerful time for me and times when I get the most of my spirit contact also around 3 a.m., which can be very problematic, especially if I have to get up for work the next day and I've got things to do. But that's one thing I don't enjoy <laughs> about being a scryer is that there are times when I just want to get my sleep. That can be hard just because it makes it hard you know, for me to get up in the morning and do things the next day. Some people, I think, will have affinity to different times. That spirit contact is just going to be easier for them. And you just got to pay attention to it. To this day, when you have those experiences, are there mantras? Are there techniques? Do you get out a journal and start conversing and writing down with, you know, some kind of engagement? Like, how do you how do you handle that today when that happens? Yeah, most of the time, if it's not the particular spirit that I mentioned at the beginning, all I have to do is sing a couple of songs that I've in Irish that I've created over the years. And it's, you know, everything's cleared out. But if it's that particular spirit, there's really nothing I can do. I can't send it away. I can't really communicate with it. I just have to deal with the fact that it's there. For that particular spirit, there's just, yeah, I don't have any techniques that have ever worked. That part's not so keen on it. But I don't know if I'll ever figure that out. But I still do think that there's something important about it. I guess I, I just don't know what it is at this point. Speaking of individual experience, Helena is asking another question, which is, Ben, does location matter for scrying as well, being in a particular place? Mm, yeah. One of the things that's great about working with Broder Chassan is that he is so good at creating that space for you to be in. The anointing oils that he uses, the incense that he uses, the lighting and the way he sings, the room that he's created, you know, specifically for this workings, dedicated to that purpose. There really is something powerful about that. I think you can feel it even when you walk into places that have just been holy for a long time, you know, whether it's a, a cathedral or the first time I went into Newgrange, Bruna Boigne, it was just, it was unbelievable. You can tell, you, you can feel the power of a place like that when you realize, my God, you know, this place has been sacred to so many people for over 5,000 years. That's an incredible span of time. So yeah, the place definitely matters. And I think too, when you have, and this kind of comes from my own more druidic perspective, but a place that is in between. So, you know, in Irish tradition, they say that at the edge of water, poetry is revealed to poets. And so being next to water, like whether it's a creek or a lakeside or the seashore, is an in-between place between the sea and the land. Being on a mountaintop, you're between the earth and the sky. When you're in a cave, you're surrounded by that chthonic, you know, energy. Um, and you're going to get different experiences based on what where you're at. So yeah, place definitely matters. But especially trees, you know, like certain trees can also really make it just being in physical contact with certain trees really can make it much easier to see and experience the other world. You know, Ben, too, we do have a, a listener question that I think might be in a lot of people's minds. And this one is from Love Jungle, who is asking, I have an active mind, Love Jungle says. And even though I have a regular meditation practice and am a performer with ample access to my emotional and imaginative life, I still am not able to scry successfully. I feel like my mind gets in the way and tries to figure it out, or it has some concept of what should happen instead of just listening. And so Love Jungle is asking, Ben, is there a kind of shift a mentally oriented person needs to make in order to scry? Yes, I can really relate to that because I'm, I'm a double Aquarian and I am in my head a lot. And uh, one of the things that, I, that helped me, especially towards the beginning, 
and you'll see this actually in a lot of indigenous tradition, you have to exhaust the body sometimes. You don't want to worry so much about trying to still your thoughts or, or doing meditation, stuff like that. Those are helpful and you definitely don't want to, to like cut that out. But sometimes you just got to run, you got to lift weights, you got to ride a bike. You got to do something that is going to exhaust the body. And when you get to a place of exhaustion with a body, the mind will naturally clear the mind will naturally calm down. If you can get to a place where you get to that point and you experience that clarity, just develop a familiarity with how that feels. And you may have to repeat exhausting body. Like I met a South African Sangoma who talked about, you know, the very first time that he was able to have a full blown waking vision was after 48 hours of straight dancing and they do that deliberately in a lot of indigenous traditions to absolutely exhaust the body and bring on a trance-like state. I was fortunate enough to meet the Sangoma at a time when I really needed that, that advice. It really does work. So that would be my biggest advice would be, don't worry so much about meditation. You I mean, don't cut it out, but work with the body first and just exhaust it. When the mind clears out on its own, just become familiar with how that feels and then consider working yourself to a place of physical, doing some physical activity before you try to scry and try to carry that with you into the operation itself. We do to that point, Ben, have a, another listener question from Jeff Smith, who is asking what exercises, if not outright ritual, Ben, do you suggest to get a person in the right headspace before scrying? And as you just mentioned, obviously doing something to exhaust the body. And Jeff is also asking, would it be something like sexual abstinence as used by monks or hedonistic excess as used by Crowley? Also, mm. Jeff says Franz Barden talks about using herbal mixtures to wash the eyes. Are any of these ideas that, that you would consider? One thing that really is important for me is fasting. If I know that I'm going to be doing something with Frater Chasson, I usually won't eat at all until for that day, until the, the operation is done, because there is something about eating food that just, you know, kind of, it forces your body to focus on this world. You know, it just kind of grounds you in a way that I think makes it harder for you to be able to see and open up. So I, I usually won't eat anything before I do an operation. And then I'll definitely keep myself extremely well hydrated. Something about water. And that's something I learned from Orion Foxwood. If you really need to see, you need to make sure that for days ahead of time, you're like just a religious fanatic about keeping yourself hydrated. It's really important because it's fuel for your sight. And he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. Just put like a pinch of salt in everything that you drink so that you don't get rid of all of your electrolytes. So I'll just put a little bit of crystalline salt in there, you know, everything I drink. And it's like a small amount doesn't need to be a lot. Fasting, hydration, those are probably the biggest ones for me. Some breathing exercises, especially before you begin doing long, slow, deep breathing. And I'll also do something like if I'm really having a hard time getting my, if I feel like I've done all those things and I'm still feeling like I'm not, that eye isn't open. I'll do an actually, this is a sort of an Appalachian technique that Orion taught me, and it's just called quaking. It's just kind of shaking the head from side to side in a rhythmic manner, or shaking the body from side to side in a rhythmic manner, whether it's side to side or front and back, almost like you're rocking yourself into a trance. So using the body to kind of do something rhythmic with your body, even if you're just sitting there rocking back and forth or side to side or moving your head from side to side. It looks a little strange from the outside, but that has helped me uh, quaking before I try to see if nothing else works. To take the total opposite side of this question, Ben, um, Jeff Smith is asking, what mental exercises do you think should be forbidden for the aspiring scryer or things that should be prescribed for the aspiring scryer? So, for instance, do entheogens fall into the latter category, you know, or using substances? Is, is, is there anything you think should be forbidden or, or just not used if you are scrying or anything to avoid? Well, I've used entheogens before and had some very profound and very healing experiences with those kinds of plants. For me personally, I have to be very careful 
with those. I actually have a friend who uses mushrooms professionally in therapy who's amazing at it and has taught me a ton. But I've noticed for me, it's also a very purifying experience <laughs> in more ways than one. So I have to be very careful with those. So I wouldn't really necessarily say there's anything forbidden that I can say. I'm not usually very comfortable with forbidding myself or anybody else to do anything anyway. But as far as things to do, the singing and the chanting for me is really powerful. Doing a rhythmic practice of some kind, whether it's just clapping or drumming or singing in some way, there's something about a regular pulse or cadence or rhythm that just helps, I think, relax and open the mind, which is why so many traditions use it, you know, whether it's shamanic or even Gregorian chant, you know, in the Middle Ages. There's just something about the experience of song and rhythm that opens the mind up and allows it to experience things I don't think it otherwise would. Cynthia Carter, one of our listeners, has a question for you. And Cynthia is saying, I just made my first fluid condenser using gateways through stone and circle. Do you, Ben, Cynthia is asking, use a fluid condenser? And if so, please clarify if I'm to smear the liquid on and leave it while scrying, or do I wipe it off after I impregnate it so that my mirror is as clear as possible? Cynthia is asking, would I impregnate it before each sitting or just once in a while to charge it? And are there any symbols that you use and or favorite recipes for a fluid condenser? Gosh, you know, that's a good question, but it's probably better for Frater Chasson to answer that. I, for me, what I use, this actually comes from Orion has given me, it's a particular ointment that's made with deer fat and some other herbs that I'll use that you put in the middle of your palms and you put on your forehead as an aid to sight. And it does seem to work. You have to keep it in the dark so that it doesn't get exposed to sunlight. It tends to degrade it somehow. I know that he's used that. I just, most of the time when that's done, I'm usually sitting in the seer's chair or the, you know, the scryer's chair, and I'm just sort of kind of getting my mind prepared. So, Unfortunately, I don't know the ins and outs of that very well. Actually, Ben, one of the things that you've really been sharing, and it's just such a blessing, is your own techniques of what works and tips. And we do have another question from Jeff Smith, who is asking, what things can a person do to train the gift of sight other than keeping, let's say, a dream journal? What basic exercises can be done? Jeff is saying some books describe certain exercises such as staring at objects of inconsequential value in both the spiritual and mundane worlds. Is, is that something you, you would suggest or have ever done? If I was starting from a place where I hadn't seen much at all, it's hard because you know, those sort of things, they just sort of happened to me. You know, if you're looking for a practice that's going to open that up, one of the things that I usually start with that I will use if I feel like that sense is sort of dulling is I will actually lay down in a bed. I will turn the lights out. I usually sing some sort of prayer and then I'll light a candle and I do some protective techniques with the candle. But they can be anything that you happen to use in your own tradition. And then I will lay down, I'll close my eyes, and I will wait until the lights behind my eyes appear. And, you know, you'll start seeing lights and shapes and that sort of thing. And I will focus as much of my attention on the lights behind my eyes as I can until they start to form shapes and patterns. And once you get to the point where they start forming shapes and patterns, you will initially slip into a dream-like state where you'll see images or you'll hear voices and it'll just be random stuff, you know, like someone you saw last week at the store or something, you know, it, it doesn't have to be anything necessarily profound, but you're familiarizing yourself with that twilight state of consciousness. And then you'll come out of it suddenly because you'll see something or hear something that might jar you or pop you back into a conscious state, which is fine. Just go back again to looking at the light behind your eyes and the patterns they form and just kind of dip your mind into that twilight space as much as possible. And over time, that will help. 
quiet the mind is what you're saying and re-dip your mind back into that state. Like it's okay to have different levels of consciousness or different reactions to what you're doing. Yeah. That's a great way to say it, Alex. Yeah. Because you need that conscious state when you're scrying anyway, because if you're going to be answering questions, you can't totally check out. So you've got to kind of have one foot in both worlds, you know? So if you get pushed out of that place temporarily, that's a good thing because you're training your senses, your perception to pop between those two states easily. So if you relax with it and just enjoy it, just, you know, play with it, you'll get much more out of it than trying to achieve something in it. That's usually where, you know, you kind of just lock up your energies and nothing ends up happening. This brings up a question that I know that you and Brian were talking about a little bit before on the last podcast, but something I've always wondered is, can you share a little bit more about how you relay information to a magician? So for example, like you're there with Frater Chassan, you're experiencing this incredibly powerful vision of Archangel Samael or Kasael, whatever it may be, a very intense vision. Yet you as the scryer have to translate that or communicate that or report it back to, say, Frater Chassan, who is the operator, how can you effectively do that when it's sometimes such a powerful vision? Honestly, I think that's why the Druids were so obsessed with poetry was because they understood that when you do step into spaces like that, having a poet's voice enables you to communicate things that you couldn't otherwise do. The more you write poetry on your own, then the more adept you become at communicating those things with the profundity that they carry. Poetry is important, I think, really genuinely important for a scryer. It's not something that I've actually mentioned, and I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before, but it is important. There's something about learning to communicate as a poet that enables you to relate those experiences that allow it to have some impact on the people who are going to be reading it, and then, then the magician, because the more the magician is impacted by what is being related, the more impassioned they get, and the more interested they get, and the more their questions just sort of spontaneously erupt from them. And it's those spontaneous questions that maybe weren't necessarily planned at the beginning of the operation that become some of the ones that are the most amazing, the most impactful. If you're playing with that twilight state of consciousness on a regular basis, and there are times too when I can't relate the absolute fullness of what I'm seeing while the operation is going on. So we always have a debriefing session at the end when it's all done. Frater Chassan will ask me to, okay, what do you remember? Lead me through what you remember about the experience. And there will be often things that I, that I did experience during the operation that I wasn't able to communicate while it was taking place. So debriefing afterwards is really important because you'll remember a bunch of stuff that you weren't able to communicate during the actual ceremony itself. That brings up something, and especially to your point, Ben, about you know talking in poetics and having this kind of verdancy of language. I know previous guests have mentioned this as well. How do you do that? Is it reading specific Celtic poetry and kind of internalizing the style and then applying it to day-to-day -day actions that you're taking out? How do you go about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. Like finding poets that you really admire and that really speak to you in some way that really impact you emotionally. And you see the words that they use and the symbols that they use to convey particular emotions or particular states of consciousness or experience. And then one of the other things that I did that I like doing is I will take a journal for like a um, full year. I just committed, I was going to write a poem every day, even if it was total crap. <laughs> um, I was just going to write a poem, you know. And then I wrote a poem on one side of the page. And then at the end of the year, I went back to the beginning of the poem, the first poem that I wrote. And then I revised the poem on the other side and tried to make it better. And I did that every day. And what I could see was how I was progressing. And then when I returned back to a poem, how would I say this differently? How would I convey this a little bit more skillfully, a little bit more masterfully than I had the first time? 
it may not sound like it has a lot of relevance, I guess, maybe to magical traditions, but it does. There's something about the way in which you're using language. Cause I mean, some of those experiences are so beyond what you can convey that you have to use tricks, you know, you have to use tricks in, in language in order to get it fully across. So that kind of repetition of uh, writing poems and then revising them after a certain period of time, once you've written enough of them, that's what helped me. Well, I, I certainly hope that that inspires the listeners out there to make sure to take up their own journals and, and really work at that as well if, if they feel drawn to it, because that is absolutely wonderful. We do also, yeah. Ben, have a question from Kevin Carlo, who is asking, how about, Ben, the cell phone screen as the modern black mirror, both metaphorically and literally? Have you, Ben, ever heard of anyone actually trying to use a phone or a similar electronic device as a literal scrying tool? Well, you know, I can't say that I have, but like I said, when we were talking earlier, if it's something that is calling out to you and it's given you you know, the heebie-jeebies to think about using that as a device, then I think it's something you should probably pursue because these things are meant to change and they're meant to adapt to our current conditions. So I could totally see that being a possibility. For me, it, it, I don't think I could do it just because I don't, you know, I associate that device with so many other things. But I could see how if it does give you that sort of chills up the spine type reaction, when you're considering using it that way, then I would say that's a good sign to try. Now, that is really, really good advice to find your own idiosyncratic, your own individual way to approach that. And just kind of stepping back to Ben, what are two or three things that people usually always confuse or maybe they always kind of misunderstand about scrying that you wish they understood better or what are two or three things that you wish people always would keep in mind just when it comes to scrying as a whole or scrying in general? Yeah, I mean, I've had this discussion with a few of Friar Chasson's students during some of his workshops. I've noticed that a lot of people make the assumption that when I'm in front of the crystal or I'm in front of the mirror, that my eyes are open the entire time and I'm seeing absolutely everything like played out as if it's like a movie being projected onto the mirror or onto the crystal. That is not my experience of how that works. What normally happens is that at the beginning, I will focus very intently on, say, the crystal or the mirror, and I will start to see shapes and images. But at some point, the images will bring on a, such a receptive state of mind that my eyes will just suddenly close and I am seeing everything with my mind. I'm not staring at the crystal and, and watching a movie. And I think a lot of people assume that. And so they get stuck on this. It's going to outwardly manifest 100%. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there haven't been things that have happened in the room that weren't outward manifestations of spirit contact. That's happened as well. But the majority of what I'm seeing is taking place with my mind. The mirror or the crystal is the initial gateway that my mind steps through to see. That's the biggest thing that I've seen is that a, uh, and a lot of students are like, oh, well, I was just really discounting what was going on, you know, in my mind because I was thought I was just imagining it. And it's like, well, no, that's where you're going to get the most contract. A mirror or a crystal isn't as finely tuned a device for perception as your body is, not even close. Ben, we also have a listener question from Mikkel J, who is asking, have Ben and Brian ever considered performing an invocation of Jesus Christ? I remember seeing that question. I don't think we have. And I don't know exactly why we haven't. I know that one of the things that I have experienced, and this was one of those experiences that I did not expect, especially as a Druid, when the name would come up during particular interactions with some of the angels, especially when that name was mentioned, the incredible amount of love was overpowering. I'm not a Christian. It's not a tradition that I have a lot of personal interest in. But whenever the name did come up in some of those interactions, 
I was moved to tears by the amount of love that was associated with that name and the amount of love that the angels would express when that name was said was absolutely overwhelming sometimes, genuinely, genuinely overwhelming. But we haven't done that. And, you know, it's an interesting idea. We do have a listener question from Helena who is asking, can you tell us a little bit more about your new book? Yeah. So originally I had been writing a book based on kind of how I got into Druidry, trying to kind of put a compendium together of how I see it. But as I've gone through it and a good friend of mine who does conversations with the Grove podcast with me and Brendan Ellis Williams, I've realized that there's some definitely some things I need to learn about the whole publishing world and, you know, how the logistics of just getting a book published. So I'm still writing that one. But after that experience with Anayel and my own particular interactions with Breed or Bridget, whenever I looked at Venus, whether it was the morning star or the evening star, I'd always just felt a particular way that reminded me of how I feel when I'm in the presence of Bridget. And so the book is basically about how I ended up filling out that connection and understanding it, and then using the synodic cycle of Venus as a ceremonial cycle to understand Bridget herself and her story, her story cycle from her birth through her marriage, her birth of her son, the death of her son, and her manifestation as the Banshee. So basically following the cycle of Venus around the sun and correlating that to Bridget's mythological cycle and then ceremonial thresholds that you can follow along the way to understand that. But as an example, the beginning of the cycle, and this is sort of a uniquely Celtic thing, the beginning of the cycle is actually when it first appears as the evening star. And that is when it's the furthest away from the earth, it's the dimmest, and it is just emerging from the superior conjunction it's on the other side of the sun directly from the earth if we were looking at it so it would create a direct line between the earth the sun and then venus on the other side so when it moves out of that superior conjunction it's going to start rising in the western sky and appears as the evening star and the character between the evening star and the morning star is well known amongst hellenistic astrologers pretty much the world over and I believe as well, similarly among the Celts and the Neolithic Irish. So that is the moment that corresponds to the birth of Bridget and the various traditions that surround that and her protection of infants and newborns, her being a patroness of midwives, that sort of thing. And then as it goes through, when you get to its maximum Western rise, then you're getting uh, more towards when she, the time, the threshold that corresponds to her marriage to her husband, Bress, and the birth of her son. And so each of the phases of its orbit around the sun carries a particular energy, not only astrologically, but also mythologically. By connecting those things together ceremonially, it's just taught me a lot. And so that's what the book is sort of an explanation of. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ben. And I I know the listeners will definitely keep our ear to the ground on any any future updates with that for sure. Can you tell us just kind of a little bit about the Dunmore Druid Order and just how it kind of came to be and anything that you'd like people to know about the order itself? Yeah, you bet. And it's it's pronounced the Dunmore uh, Druid Order. Oh, Dunmore. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. It was sort of born out of a previous group that I had facilitated locally in Colorado Springs. As time went on, I really wanted to get to know other Druids in in other parts of the world and other parts of the country. But I also really wanted to, unlike OBOD, which is an organization I, I absolutely respect, I wanted it to be rather than a mail order or course driven type organization. I really wanted to have something that was all about personal mentorship and personal interaction. And so together with Brendan and Arlene and a few other folks like Dustin Clayton and some others, we've been basically trying to develop what we think is the best way to mentor people in Druidry and 
bring back a uh, appreciation of the stories and the language and the thresholds of the year and the thresholds in a person's life. So whether it's birth and the coming of age and marriage and retirement or death, you know, things of that nature and paying attention to those thresholds and then the various thresholds that take place during the month and during the day. Those are times that we sort of kind of walk through blindly, but they're moments in which we have access to a larger cosmic force than we would during typical times in life. You know, like the first time those can be very joyful moments. They can be very sorrowful moments. You know, when I first got the call that my mom had been diagnosed with multiple myeloma, when you hear something like that in that moment, your world is totally different and it will never be the same again. And those are sacred, sacred moments that a druid learns to pay attention to. Those threshold moments are not something that you just blindly walk through or unconsciously walk through. You learn to recognize when a threshold moment is taking place and you take full advantage of it. Whether that's just a sunrise or a sunset or the birth of your first child or your second child or the first time you drive away from your home to go to college or whatever it happens to be, those are all threshold moments. And I wanted to bring people's attention to that through the medium of Druidry. And I also wanted to focus on what I call the three core teachings of Dunmore, which is, I am the other. Diversity is the sacred expression of unity. And the people in the land are one. And those three teachings are what I feel are kind of a steadying force or a litmus test to spiritual revelation, because spiritual revelation, as wonderful and as powerful as it is, can also lead people to do some totally crazy, insane things that can be very hurtful to others and to the planet itself. This has been such an amazing, almost like a guided tour of someone who is a master scryer and tips and the history of Druidry. Is there anything else that we have not touched on yet or just anything else that that you'd like to leave the listeners with? One of the things that's been on my mind and in my thoughts and in some of the spirit interactions that I've had over this last year is I really feel strongly that we all develop a certain amount of familiarity and commitment to truth. Truth was considered extremely important in the Druidic tradition. And ironically enough, in today's information age, it seems even more elusive than ever. And I think that's because we have a tendency now to kind of go down the rabbit hole of our own particular existing beliefs and not challenge our existing beliefs. And when we do that, rather than challenging what we think or challenging what we believe, and we seek to only constantly reinforce what we believe and think, that is where I think so much of the polarization is coming from in today's society right now, politically or culturally racially, whatever mode of life you want to talk about, it's important, I think, for people to understand that truth isn't a trophy. Truth isn't something that you claim and you win in some sort of competition. Truth is something that comes to you when your mind is quiet and you're in a state of mind that is beyond suspicion. It's beyond fear and it's beyond concern about the future. Truth is something that will happen to you when you are able to develop a sense of trust in the direction that the world and your life is heading in. And if you're fighting against that and you're finding comfort in the zealous mob rather than the silence of your own heart, then it's really important to stop, take a step back and reevaluate what you're doing. That is incredibly powerful. Was scrying that tool, that vehicle, that that key and lock that helped 
unlock an ability for you in your years of experience, Ben, to help achieve that quietness and find that truth or bathe in the truth or embrace the truth as you found it? Yeah, I definitely think so. Because in the interactions that I've had, whether it's with spirits or or just other human beings or great teachers that I've been fortunate to come across, I've noticed that people that have kind of a greater understanding and a deeper wisdom, there's an ability for them to step into that quiet place that other people don't seem to have. And we run so much from task to task and from goal to goal that we lose that memory that sometimes you just got to sit at the base of a tree and hear the wind going through the leaves and just be a human being for a little while and not try to accomplish anything or not try to conquer things and not try to rule some area of your life. You know, you've got to let things unfold. And scrying has been a great way for me for that because it requires that of your mind in order to be able to see the truth and in order to experience these minds of wisdom, you know, especially among the archangels, because you really realize, and the she too, that you're experiencing something that has just an understanding of reality that I have no possibility of fully comprehending. I'm getting just the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg, you know, of the fullness of that being. And so the arrogance that we have as human beings can be so stifling to our ability to learn and to listen. Scrying has definitely helped me to recognize that. Yeah, that seems to be one of the biggest contradictions out there. I've spoken with Frater Ash and Chassan about this before, which is people on the outside of ceremonial magic or grimoire magic might look and say, well, look at you. You got your sword and you're standing in a circle and, you know, puffing your chest. But when you actually hear about and read the experiences, for example, in Gateways Through Light and Shadow and the experiences that you and as Frado Chassan has mentioned, it is nothing but humbling. It is just deeply just sitting there and just going, did that really happen? Like, what a humbling experience. How much do we not understand about the veils of reality, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That's it on the nose, Alex. Yeah. I mean, because you can't come away with having an experience like that and not realizing that there is so much more to the cosmos than you have heretofore seen, smelt, listened to, or touched. Or tasted. I mean, those are wonderful, awesome, rich experiences on their own. But it is just the barest glimpse of what's out there. And I think that's the wonderful thing about this, that whether it's Druidry or Grimoire magic or shamanism or all sorts of different other arts and sciences, if it hasn't humbled you and it isn't opening your heart to others rather than closing it down then you may want to reconsider your approach because that matters. Master Spirit Scryer, Druid, founder of the Dunemore Druid Order, Ben McStefan, thank you just so, so much for taking the time and sharing the gift of your time and wisdom with our listeners today. Just really, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Alex. And right back at you, man. You're such a good interviewer. You ask such great questions and you do such a good service to people just giving people a time and a voice to speak it's definitely enriched my life and i'm very grateful for what you do as well listeners all i can say is wow ben's wisdom and openness is such a beautiful reminder for all of us to slow down open our hearts and take our time in connecting with the earth the spirits and the deepest parts of ourselves because as ben says your body and mind are so much more receptive to detecting spiritual presence than any crystal or obsidian mirror could by itself 
So we'll definitely stay tuned for updates on Ben's future book. And also, there is a really cool podcast sponsored by the Dune More Druid Order. It's called Conversations in the Grove. So make sure to check out that link in the description to support that podcast on Patreon. Also, speaking of Patreon, your Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions were, as usual, amazing, elucidating, wonderful. Thank you so, so much. And if you are interested in some exclusive perks and content, Content, but you also want to help keep the lights on here at Glitch Bottle, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash glitch bottle. And you can always subscribe and listen to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Yeah.